Amen. Take your Bible, open them to a couple places. John chapter 6. We're beginning a new chapter today. And 1 Corinthians chapter 8, as it'll help to weave together in our introduction to this section of John 6. We're studying the book of John together in our weekend services, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. We're not going too fast or too slow. We have no really motives of how fast to go. We just want to walk alongside Jesus. We want to put ourselves next to him. We want to learn from him. We want to draw near. We, we want him to disciple us. We want him to teach and train us. Because the Bible says, Jesus said, that a student, when he's perfectly trained, will be like his master. And that's our desire in life. We don't want to conform to an image of a church. And we don't want to conform to an image of a pastor. And we don't want to conform to an image of what somebody wants from us. We want, and the work of God is that we would be conformed into the image of Jesus. And so our time in, in John's gospel has been doing that, has been growing us, has been helping us to gain insight on how to respond to different things in our lives. And today will be no different. Now, when I mention the word test, not everybody's so excited because not everybody likes tests. That might be you. Uh, for me personally, I've always liked tests. I'm the kind of guy that could study the night before, ace the test the next day, and actually remember stuff. That God just made it in my mind where I can grab things and, and he has helped me to remember things in that way. But not everybody. I mean, if I took a poll right now, how many of you like tests? Very few hands would go up. It says, who likes tests? There's actually, there's actually a phenomenon that they have found when it comes to tests. Because you might be one of these people that will study and study and study and study and you do little pop quizzes along the way. You, do, you, you go online and you're taking little quizzes. But then when the test is laid before you, you bomb it. And you're like, what happened? Well, they call this test anxiety. Where it's just the test itself and the pressure that you feel in the test. Where you forget what you studied and all the little helps that your teacher helped you with. And there you are, you're ready, you're ready, you're ready. And when they put the test on you, even though you knew it was coming. But how about, well how about when the teacher doesn't give you a test that you know about. But your teacher, she drops on you a pop quiz. How about that? Why do they do that? A pop quiz. I'll tell you why they do that. They want to know if you've been paying attention. They want to know if you've been taking notes. Your teacher wants to know if you've been grasping the concepts. And really a pop quiz is more for you than it is for the teacher. It's more for you to gain insight of where you're at because the test is coming. And while the pop quiz has a certain amount on your grade level, the test has a much greater amount. And so it's a tool and it's a plan of preparation. Now, let me just say this. God gives pop quizzes too, along with the tests, as we'll see today. Yeah, God gives us pop quizzes too. Our gracious God tests us to see if we're learning, to really reveal to us the level of attention we've been paying. Sometimes, church, we get so confident. We become the know-it-all that we never wanted to become. And we just think we know it all. We think we've got it all together. We, we, we're coasting along. And then comes the test. Now again, I asked you to open a 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Just to be reminded today that we're not know-it-alls. That we don't know it all. And one of the ways that it gets revealed is through tests. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 beginning in verse 2. If anyone thinks he knows anything. He knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. So if any of us think we know anything, we know nothing. We're all in a state of growing and learning. We're all in a state of gaining new knowledge, applying it in our lives. And one of the ways that God draws that out of us is through tests. Now we have another word for tests. We might refer to it as a test. We'll see that word in our text today. But we have another word when it comes to tests, and that's the word trials. Either way, God allows tests. God sends tests. God allows trials. God will send trials in our lives to mature and to grow us up. It reminded me, really, of the familiar story of how a little eaglet learns how to fly. Do you know that story? Do you know how that happens? 
Well, get the picture of a nest up high in a tree with this majestic eagle with her little babies. And her little babies are coasting along in life. I mean, they got it made. They're kicking back in the nest. They got 300 channels on cable. They're flipping it through. They don't have to go to work. Yeah, mom leaves sometimes, but she always comes back with food. All they need to do is cry. Every need is taken care of. And they're living life, man. They love it. It's everything they ever wanted it to be until one day, mom seems a little mad and knocks them out of the nest. And they fly. No, they don't fly. They fall and they fall and they fall and their little wings are flapping and they don't know what they're doing. And I'm sure in their mind they're going, what's up with this? And it just lasts at the last moment. What does mom do? Mom comes and swoops down, rescues them from certain danger, takes them back to the nest of comfort and ease until another surprise push. Because if an eaglet wants to learn how to fly, mom's not going to get out the whiteboard in the nest and say, this is the aerodynamics of flying kids, and this is how you flap your wings, and if you just do this, and that's not how it happens. No, over and over, pushed out of the nest, pushed out of the nest, pushed out of the nest, until finally, that one final push, where right at the end, there's the flapping, there's the flapping, and then the eaglet takes flight and understands that mom wasn't upset at all. Mom was just using a very interesting way to teach her kids how to fly. And we feel that way with God at times, don't we? We feel that way. Why does the mother eagle kick her eaglets out of the nest? Well, you know what? If she never did, they might never leave the nest. They might never find a greater level of living. They may never embrace the beauty of flying if they didn't go through the test. You know, God, in his infinite wisdom, wants us to learn how to live by faith. He wants us to trust him. He wants us to learn in deeper levels how to depend upon him, how to live out what he's shown us, what he's taught us. Because, you know, when I get the picture of the eaglet going out, and maybe you're like that right now, you're like, I'm in the process of flying, and I'm flapping, I'm flapping, but I'm waiting for God to rescue me. Well, this is the picture in my mind that I got. I just get the picture, I'm watching it all take place, and there's the eaglet down, and if I was going to put music to it, I'd do something like this. And you know what happens at the end of that, don't? Boom! But not so. That's not how it happens. That's not how it happens with the eagle, with Mama Eagle and her babies, and it's not happen, that's not what happens with you and I. There's no crash at the end, but a lot to learn in the process. Your God and mine is a rescuing God. He's a teaching God. He's a training God. And he wants us to grow up. Why does God allow Christians to be tested? Those that call upon his name? Why does he allow temptations in our lives? Well, let me read to you from James chapter one in the New Living Translation. You can just jot it down in verse two. James writes, Dear brothers and sisters, whenever trouble comes your way, let it be an opportunity for joy. For when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. And for when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be strong in character and ready for anything. And maybe that's you. Today you're going through some testing. Faced with great temptation in the midst of a trial or two. The Lord has allowed things into your life to move you out of the nest. You're learning how to trust God. You're learning how to trust God on your own. And it's a good thing. Although it can be a little scary. Now today in John chapter 6, we're going to get a beautiful, wonderful episode in the life of Jesus. A miraculous work of God. As thousands and thousands of hungry people follow Jesus with impure motives... Jesus, moved with love and compassion, decides to serve them food with the little that they had. He multiplies them. It's an amazing miracle. And along the way, he's going to also take this opportunity of blessing others to teach his disciples. And while he's teaching his disciples, he's teaching us. He's going to show us and remind us. This is something I teach the pastors here, the leaders here, something I'm always reminded of, I'm always reminding them of, and that's this. Every moment, every situation, no matter what it is, is a discipleship moment. It's a time for me to learn, or a time for me to teach, or a time for me to learn and teach. We'll find even in this miracle that nothing is wasted by God. Nothing. And every moment is a discipleship moment. I have something to learn. 
I have some area in my life that God wants to teach me, wants to grow me up, wants me to, to be strong in. And I also need to be mindful that every situation, even in the context of the church here, I also have a responsibility as a spiritual leader to see the opportunity to teach you and to grow you and you and I can grow up in the things of God together. So while the focus of the first 14 verses is on this miraculous multiplication of food, don't miss here and everywhere, don't miss Jesus taking the opportunity to teach his disciples and by way of teaching them, teaching us. Now, with that in mind, verse one, chapter six. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. Chapter six takes us back in the ministry of Jesus to the Galilee region around the Sea of Galilee. There are actually three ways to refer to the Sea of Galilee and you see two of them here. In verse one, it says the Sea of Galilee. It's also referred to the, as the Sea of Tiberias and you'll also find the Sea of Galilee referred to as the Sea of Gennesaret. Three ways to describe the same thing. So they're up in the northern part of Israel around the beautiful area of the Sea of Galilee. And chapter six really encompasses about a year's worth, from beginning to end, about a year's worth of the ministry of Jesus up in the Galilee region. So he's back in the Galilee region and a great multitude of people is following him, a lot of people. We also notice that a lot of people are following him with impure motives. They're not following him for the right reasons. They're intrigued. Jesus has done a miracle. He heals. And that has intrigued them and it's drawn them. Signs and wonders from the life of Jesus grabbed people's attention. They're following him, but with impure motives. Motives. It's the one thing that you can't see in a person's life. Motives. You can't, you can't see another person's motives. You don't know their heart. I mean, you're not going to be able to look someone in the eye and say, I know that you have impure motives. Now, that's at the outset, because I think over time, impure motives can be revealed. Bad decisions and bad actions can start to un unfold someone's impure motives. But I mean, you don't know the heart of somebody. You, you have a hard time knowing your heart sometimes, where you don't even know your own motives, where you might do the right thing, but you do it the wrong way. Why? Because you really desire to please God, but your heart's wrong, your motives are wrong. Or you do the wrong thing, but you had the right motives. Like you, you wanted to do it right, but it just didn't turn out the way you thought it would turn out. We have a hard time knowing our own hearts, let alone someone else. And that's a biblical fact, friend. The Bible says this in our study in 1 Samuel, we've already seen this, that man looks at the outward and it's true. Perception is very important. You have to realize this, especially again, as you're serving the Lord, that perception for people is 100% of their reality. And God does, and people do look at you outwardly and they do come to conclusions by what they see you do and say outwardly. That's just the facts. And the second part of that is just as true. While man looks at the outward, God does look at the heart. So you can be sure that God knows your motives and he'll sort those motives out, but you don't wanna be comfortable with bad motives but you also don't wanna be someone that's going out looking for everyone else's bad motives. Just really focus on your own life, that God would cleanse and purify your own heart. Let me give you a few things to pray about motives because these, these are very important. We, we want not only to do the right thing, but we wanna do it for the right reasons. And so here's some things, if this is something you, stress, you, you struggle with in your life, something you're concerned about, your own motives. You know, the Bible says the heart is deceitfully wicked. You know, it, we, who can know it? Well, the Bible says God knows the heart. So you can go to God with the issues of the heart. But turn over to Psalm 24. Let me give you a few things to pray over on this topic of motives. Be ever so careful when you start to speak to other people's motives. You can speak to their actions, but you and I really don't know their heart. And we got to leave the heart to the, the heart is the realm of God. Actions, you know, we can deal with actions. I mean, if you, if you punch me in the face, <laughs> I'm like, man, that's not very nice. What were you trying to love? Was that a love tap? You know, you knock a couple of teeth out. I mean, you can, you, you know, obviously it's not good to punch someone in the face, but, but you think of it, you know, you think of somebody coming alongside and pushing you very violently. You go, what'd you do that for? 
You must not love me. You don't care. But what you didn't know is that there was a bicycle coming at like 35 miles an hour. And if they didn't push you out of the way, you would have had this accident with somebody in a bicycle. And you're like, man, I, I immediately you're like, how would you push me? But you don't know their motives. You don't know what's going on. You don't have the full picture. So you can pray this in your own life. Psalm 24, verse three. It says, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. There's four things you can pray for right there. You can begin to pray, God, clean my, let me, let me be a person with clean hands. I just have a clean conscience, the idea that my actions are pure, that my heart is pure, Lord. Purify my motives, you could pray number two. Thirdly, you can pray that you're not an idolatrous person, and not, not, not that you have little idols or statues, but that your heart is solely worshiping God, the one true God. And then finally, you can pray for a truthfulness, that you're not a deceitful person. I mean, it'll be very helpful. Turn over to Psalm 51. Let me show you. Psalm 51, something else to pray when it comes to motives. How many arguments have been started in your life with other people when you thought you knew the motives of their heart and you were wrong and now it caused a great argument? You go, you know, you just did this because, and they're like, I didn't do that because. Yes, you did. And it became an argument because you're in a realm that you have no, you, you have no, you don't know. You don't know. We have to be very careful even as we're just like, okay, Lord, I don't know other people's motives, but I just, just deal with my heart, Lord. Notice this in verse 10. Pray this. You can pray this very specifically. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Of course, we know David was praying in relationship to his repentance from great, terrible sin with Bathsheba and all the other things that went alongside of that. But I think it's a general prayer we can pray. Create in me a clean heart, Lord. That's what I want. I don't want anything else. Or you can jot this one down in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 14. O Jerusalem, wash your heart from wickedness that you may be saved. How long shall your evil thoughts lodge within you? So Jesus goes over and back in John 6, back into the Galilee region. Many people are following. We know from Matthew's gospel. By the way, this miracle recorded in John's gospel is the only miracle that's recorded in all four gospels. So you, we have all the perspectives from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for this particular miracle. We know from Matthew that this miracle comes right after Jesus hears of the death of his cousin, John the Baptist. Mark tells him, he takes, tells him and he takes some time to be alone. According to Mark chapter 6, verse 31, he says, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while because there's many coming and going and they didn't even have time to eat. Jesus in verse three, it says, went up on a mountain and he sat there with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? So up on a mountain, and don't think of the mountain when we, the Bible uses that phrase mountain for Israel as the 14ers that we have in Colorado. It's only a couple thousand feet, three or 4,000 feet, but it is up high and there is a large slope. And we learn later here that it's covered with grass. So it's springtime, which by the way, when you carefully read the Bible, you see how things put together. Passover was a springtime feast. There's grass on the hill, springtime's coming. So it's just a little piece of the timing of this happening in the life of Jesus. And here he is up on the top, kind of getting away. People are coming along the side of the mountain or the, the, the mountain for them coming up. He sees them and he sees uh, them coming up he draws attention from Philip and he just asks him a question. Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now Matthew tells us that during this dialogue that Jesus is moved with compassion. That's what's moving him to action is compassion. And I believe this, that God would have a compassionate heart in his people because we spend too much time or so much time, I should say, thinking about planning about, preparing for ourselves. We spend a lot of time thinking about ourselves, doing things for ourselves, that compassion, our compassion for others, can get a back seat in life or begin to run dry. Maybe it's not so much just thinking of ourselves, but because we're serving and helping so many people, you, you may even find that you want a day off from compassion or two or three. We're surrounded by needs. 
We have needs ourselves. But the key in life is compassion. The key, one of the keys in growing as a disciple of Jesus is to have a compassionate heart. Now we know the word passion, don't we? Passion means to be very excited about something. The word compassion adds to that of being very excited as you now are coming alongside someone with that passion. Think about having passion focused at helping someone else and compassion now coming into their lives. It's a lot like the difference between sympathy and empathy. There is a difference. Sympathy is an emotion that we express when someone is going through something and we feel bad for them. And it's a good emotion. We see someone struggling, we see somebody hurting, and we might send a sympathy card. And by the way, many of you sent sympathy cards in our own loss and we're very grateful for that. We're very grateful that you would express emotion in times of our need. And we too send sympathy cards. And what we're trying to communicate is that we feel bad for you. We're sorry that you've had to go through this. We wish you the greatest strength and we pray for you during this time of hurt or pain or sorrow or grief. Sympathy. It's a beautiful emotion. May we express it more and more. Empathy takes sympathy to another level. Because if sympathy is I'm feeling bad for you, I feel sorry for you, empathy is I feel bad with you. It's a very different thing. It adds on top of that where now you're not just feeling for someone, but you're actually entering into their life and feeling bad with them, actually doing something with that emotion, stepping into someone's life. Compassion is very much the same way, the difference between passion and compassion, very much the same thing, where compassion is like empathy. You're not only feeling something, you're doing something about it. You're stepping into someone's life in a time of deep, like if we really want to be effective church in reaching our community, it's more than just preaching at people. We need to be compassionate people. People that are entering into the difficulties of others' lives, revealing the gospel of Jesus Christ and the hope of heaven and the power of the resurrection. That we have much to offer a community that's dark and distant from God. We have much. It starts with compassion. Not hard-heartedness, not withdrawal, not self-centeredness. You know, four times we see in the scriptures compassion associated with something that Jesus teaches for us to get involved in other people's lives. This is one of them. We see Jesus moved with compassion. It's actually in Matthew's gospel. He's moved with compassion and he feeds hungry people. That's what moved him. And it was a great crowd. He was tired. He wanted some time for himself. We even know, by the way, in another gospel, that the disciples told Jesus to send them away. <laughs> we don't have time for them. I mean, this is a great need, Lord. And we just, we need some rest. Send them away. Not so for the Lord. He didn't send them away. But instead he was moved with compassion and he provides food for their physical need. Secondly, and I'll just give them to you, you can jot them down. Compassion in the Bible, in the life of Jesus' teaching is also associated with forgiveness. Do you have a forgiveness issue today? Are you living in unforgiveness? Perhaps it's not a forgiveness issue at all. It's a compassion issue. Maybe it's a heart issue in your heart and the area that you are lacking is compassion for the other person. Let me give it to you. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 26, it says, the servant therefore fell down before him saying, master, have patience with me and I'll pay you all. And then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave the debt. Another time we see compassion associated with acting on behalf of someone is in relationship to practical help. Practical help. Not just feeding a meal, but you'll remember when Jesus was giving the story of the man on his way to Jericho. He got beat up and, and left for dead and the priest lit on one side and the priest went on the other side, but it was the Samaritan that stopped and rendered help and rendered aid. Remember that story? You guys with me? Everybody with me? So here in Luke's gospel, chapter 10, verse 33, listen to what it says. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. And listen what happened. So he went to him, bandaged his wounds, 
pouring on oil and wine. He set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And we know if you read on, when he dropped him off at the end to be careful because he had to continue on his journey, he left some money, says, if this doesn't cover it, whatever you need to do with him, just hook up with me later, I'll take care of it. That's what, it moved him with compassion. He didn't just pass him by. He didn't see somebody in great need that has already been ignored and just like, well, I'll move on. But because of his compassionate heart, he self-sacrificially gave of his own stuff, even with the possibility of giving more in the future. Why? Because of compassion. And finally, we also see compassion connected to receiving the backslidden back. Some of you right now are praying for backslidden kids and you're praying for them to come back. And one of the things you need to pray for is compassion when they do. You're praying for maybe a mom or a dad or somebody you've served with for years. You've served with for years and then make a bad turn and they're, they're what we would consider backslidden. They're not living for the things of God anymore. They're not engaged in any healthy relationship with the Lord anymore. I mean, for all intents and purposes, you kind of look at their life and you might even think, man, they don't even love God anymore. But as you're praying for them to come back, you also need to add in your own heart God, give me compassion when they do. What they don't need is a finger pointing in the chest and how could you and how would you. And we have an insight of that in the scriptures because we have Jesus teaching us about the prodigal son. You remember the prodigal son? He came to his dad and and it reads in the Bible like, I just want my inheritance. But, But it meant much more than that. We've got a young kid that's growing into early adulthood that comes to his dad and essentially says to his dad, you know, it'd be better if you were dead. Because if you were, I'd get your inheritance. I want it now. Just really minimizing the relationship with his dad. Not in any way interested in it. I just want your money. That's all I want from you. And the dad's brokenhearted, gives him his inheritance, and he moves on. He lives an empty life, finally comes to his senses. He comes back home to dad. And listen to what the Bible says in Luke chapter 15, verse 20. And he arose and came to his father, this backslidden kid, But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. (laughs) Welcome home, son. I'm sure that he prayed and looked out every day for his son to come home. And this was the day. And he was filled with compassion. And what a great reunion it was. Practical help and practical needs practical help in relationship to great pain and sorrow and difficulty and bodily injury, forgiveness, receiving the backslidden. Those are just a few of the things concerned and contained and connected with compassion. If we want to be effective in sharing the love of Jesus, we must have and we must cultivate and we must pray for a compassionate heart. Because now back in John chapter 6, it's out of a compassionate heart that Jesus asked this question. Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Verse 6. But this he said to test him. You might want to mark that. He said this to test him. Because Jesus wants us to learn and he wants us to pass the tests of life. And notice, he said this to test him for he himself knew what he would do. Just pause there for a second and and take in the truth today that Jesus knew what he was going to do. It's true for you too. You might be in the midst of a test right now, in the midst of a trial, but Jesus knows what he's going to do. He knows. You can trust him. He knows what he's going to do in your life. He knows how it's all going to work out. He knows. It's not something that he doesn't know about in your life. God knows what he's doing and he knows what he's going to do and he's leading you by faith to test you and mature you. And then what do we feel like? We're like, well, I don't know what he's doing. What is this all about? And we're like the little eaglet, aren't we? And our life just feels like, and like, what is going on? I'm a believer. I love you. How could you possibly allow this, God? What's going on? I don't understand. Jesus knows what he's going to do. He knows. Isn't that what God said in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11? For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. That's a promise to you, not just to the nation of Israel. It's a promise to every person that follows God. It's a promise that is repeated here where it says Jesus knows what he's going to do. He knows the thoughts. Listen to this in Isaiah. That was Jeremiah 29, 11, by the way. In Isaiah chapter 46, verse 10, it says that God declares the end from the beginning. 
and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. God knows. So he knew, but he was testing Philip. Verse 7, Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have a little. Philip is a lot like some of you where Philip was the kind of guy that would run the numbers. <laughs> so he's, man, there's a thousand, you know, 5,000 people as we'll see in a minute. If everyone, if every one of the men, because the men were the only ones counted, had a wife and child, you're looking at about 15,000 people to feed. Now I was just here on Friday night. We had 368 women in this room. And let me say, it was not an easy thing to feed them all. We had guy, 100 guys scrambling over here, the chefs, the, the drinking stations, and then serve. I mean, it was 368. Can you imagine? 15,000? So Philip, I don't look down on him. He's like, wait a minute, supplies. We've only got like 200 denarii, which is about two-thirds of a salary, a yearly salary. A denarii was a, a day's wage. So about two-thirds of, of a yearly salary. Let, let's just put a number on it. Say they've got $30,000. they got $30,000 is not enough to feed 15,000 people. We just, and even if we had, you know, what we did with it, it's not going to be sufficient. We don't know what. And so he runs the numbers. He's a mathematician. He works the numbers. And that was his answer. Verse 8. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, oh, there's a lad here that has five barley loaves. You think of it, five little biscuits. We're not talking about big loaves here, but five little biscuits and two fish, which are like sardine, like little baby fish. Not, this isn't a feast here. It's a kid's lunch. Maybe his mom packed for him. Maybe he packed for himself, stuck it in the fold of his garment there to carry out for the day for the, just for himself when he gets hungry. And so he brings them. And that's kind of cool. He finds them and brings them. But notice his conclusion. But what are they among so many? So you have Philip running the numbers and you've got Andrew not seeing the possibilities. Not enough. Not enough. Well, Jesus in verse 11 took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to those sitting down, likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. Now the beauty of this test is that Jesus doesn't give up on his disciples when they reveal a hardness of heart. Just like he doesn't give up on you when your hardness of heart is revealed or your lack of faith or your doubt here are the disciples. We've got one trying to run the numbers. We've got another one. This isn't possibly enough. What, are, what is it? Not really seeing the potential of Jesus. They did have already seen Jesus make water into wine. They know he can do it. They, they've already seen him heal somebody at the pools of Bethesda. They, they've seen the power. I know they're growing just like you and I are. They're growing in their understanding of Jesus. Even though they're getting glimpses of his faithfulness, they've still got a long way to go. And God's going to take, he doesn't give up on them. God's going to take them all the way there this long. He meets them. Jesus does right where they're at. He doesn't give up on them. He doesn't dismiss them. I mean, if you think about it, if you think about it, it would have been very easy to say, oh, you guys want to send them away? Oh, Philip, you want to run the numbers? Oh, Andrew, you don't think that's enough? Okay, boys, give me the bread, give me the fish, and you guys sit right over there. I'm going to teach you a lesson. And try to shame them, try to teach them. No, instead, he's going to let them participate in the lesson <laughs> he's going to put everything in their hands and they're going to be blown away that you'll find when you're faced with a mathematical problem with the Lord it's not too complicated for him and when you're faced with an issue with the Lord a problem of having not enough Jesus will always tell you just bring what you have just bring what you have just just bring what you have well, I just have a couple of crumbs of a barley. I just have a couple of bar this kid. We, we found this kid and we shook him down, man. He's got five pieces of bread and two little fish. But what are they, you know? Well, just bring it. Just give it. Give it to me. Bring what you have. The disciples are an interesting bunch. And yet they're just like us. We're not very different. And neither is Jesus in being patient with us. We learn that Jesus takes what they had, blesses it, breaks it, and then gives it to the disciples to distribute. That's what he does. He takes the loaves. He gave thanks. He blessed it. We know in other gospels he breaks them, passes them out. Then he distributes them. And the disciples to those sitting down, likewise of the fish, verse 11, as much as they wanted. This, that not only was he going to feed them, but they're going to get as much as they want. It, this is an unlimited buffet of bread and fish. 
and G- Jesus just open up a buffet right there on the mountainside and just eat and go back, as all, just eat whatever you want. And he takes it and he involves the disciples. And we don't know how it went down, but this is a long process. Like there are 15, let's say there are 15,000 people there. This is a long process. And I don't know how it worked. If, if he gave them enough for their hands and then he took it to them and he says, okay, you guys pass down and you guys, I mean, even if you did that a couple hundred times, this ought to take an all day. It's going to take some time. But every time they would have to come back and they'd say, okay, Jesus, give me more. And then they would leave. And okay, Jesus, I'm here for more. And then they would leave. And that is a pattern in our lives where you, have, you come to the Lord with empty hands and he fills them and then you give it away. And you come back with empty hands and he fills them and you give it away. That's the life of the believer. That's the life spiritually where you're in a church service right now. You're listening to a Bible study and God is filling you up for what? The purpose of giving it away. That's why God's filling you up to grow you, to develop you, so that you can give the love of God away in a very practical way. That's the same thing that happens with your money. God gives you money. He gives you money once a month. He gives you money on a Friday. He gives you twice a month. However you get paid, he fills you up so that you might give it away. Yes, sir, you have, and I have responsibilities in my home, but that's not the only reason why God is. The Bible is very clear that he hasn't only given us uh, resources to take care of our homes, but to bless and to take care of others. But instead... There are often times that we will hold back what we have, thinking that that's the way that God multiplies. The way that God multiplies is not by holding back. The way that God multiplies is by giving up. And you find a lot of math in the life of Jesus, in the life of the church. You find God adding. You find God subtracting. But you know what this one is? This is God multiplying. And they had nothing. This was somebody else's bread and fish. Think about the kid for a second. Think about the kid. You're looking around. Do you have anything? You have, nobody has anything. And the little kid says, I do. What do you have? Five bread. Well, give it to me. What? That's my lunch, man. You don't take my lunch. <laughs> you know? No, you give it to me because the master needs it. Okay. And this kid gives up everything. And, and you know what? He also is fed as much as he wanted. He's getting fed. He was going to be satisfied with five pieces of bread. You know, maybe mom usually put three, but a couple extra this time. And no, he usually gets no fish, but he got two little treats that would bless him for lunch. And what does he do? He gives everything. And what was the reward in his life? He too got as much as he wanted. Who knows what that kid ate. But after he got over the initial shock of giving everything up, He began to enjoy the blessing of God and the abundant giving heart of our God. So much emphasis is made, and I do believe it's necessary at time on our heart for giving. The Bible is very clear. But if you ever want a heart for giving, you've got to understand the giving heart of God. He gave everything for you and I. He gave everything in the sense of his son, Jesus Christ, dying even when we didn't want anything to do with God. Even when we were in a place where we didn't want to participate in anything. You know, even if you were raised in a godly home, God gave him his own son for you, knowing ahead of time the home you'd be born in and the life you would live surrendering to him. He gave his best. It's the giving heart of God. Now, as we close up, let me give you a few things to consider. Number one, Jesus performed this miracle through his disciples. Jesus performed this miracle through his disciples. He didn't need to. Use the 12. He could have sat him on the side and taught him a lesson. But he chose. He chose to use the disciples as instruments in this miracle. He didn't have to. And this is an important thing for those of us that seek to serve God, which should be all of us, and that's this. God doesn't need you, and he doesn't need me. He can accomplish whatever he wants to accomplish, however he wants to accomplish. However, God has chosen you. He doesn't need me, but he's chosen me. And for that, I'm grateful. He wants me to participate. He wants me to be a part of what he's doing. He he wants to use me. And he he didn't have to use the disciples. He could have, in the miracle, just had everybody have a handful of food and said, be blessed. But that's not. It was a process, a process of growth. He He doesn't have to use us, but he chooses us. Secondly, Jesus alone gets all the glory for this miracle. Even though the disciples were a part of it, and they were a part of something awesome and wonderful, when they're used... They have to remember that it was the miracle that Jesus performed, not their great distribution. (laughs) 
We did a great job giving it out. Look at us. Oh, oh, thank you for the food. Oh, you're very welcome. Yes, it was, you know, I don't know what Jesus is doing back there, but I'm delivering it. You know, I don't know how it's happening, but here it is. Yes, if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't eat. No, no, they don't do that and neither should we. You see, I believe that in our heart, in the heart of every, every one of us that have a true relationship with God through his son Jesus wants to serve him. And, and during, through that desire, God wants to use us. But let me say this and warn us all. When he does begin to use you, do not take the glory that belongs to only him. Don't take the credit for what God has done. Don't draw people to yourself. You and I, we need to learn and continually draw people past ourselves to the one that receives all the glory. Did you know the Bible actually says that God will not share his glory with any man? It's not something to be shared. We get to enjoy it. We get to bask in it. We get the afterglow of his glory. But when God begins to use you, please, please don't take the credit. That's the beginning of the end for you and for me. Which, by the way, if you are just desiring to be used of God, let me give you a few things to look at in your own life. The kind of person that God uses. You can jot them down. There's four. The kind of person that God uses. Number one, God uses a spiritual man and a spiritual woman. That's the type of person that God uses. What do you mean by that, Ed? Well, I don't mean the kind of language in the world today where people say I'm a spiritual person, but, but they don't have a relationship with the true God. I don't mean that. I mean a man or a woman that has surrendered to God and is yielding to the Holy Spirit in their lives, where the word of God is on their lips, where they're people, men and women of prayer. When, when you, in your life you are speaking of the spiritual things of life, not the fleshly or the carnal things of life. Remember the book of 1 Corinthians? It was written to a church that was very carnal, very fleshly, very human. This is not some religious social club. This is the church of the living God. This is the group of people of redeemed men and women that if God's going to use us, we must be spiritual and growing in that area of our lives. Secondly, God uses the faithful person. The faithful person. Are you faithful? Are you full of faith? Are you trustworthy? You know, the Bible tells us, Jesus does, that those that are faithful will be made ruler over many. Those that are faithful will get more responsibility. God uses faithful people, people that can be trusted, people that, are, that you can trust their word, they're reliable. They're, they're not only trustworthy, but their lives are worthy of trust. Faithful people. Because the Bible says that for the unfaithful person, Jesus in the same parable he says the unfaithful person what little they have will be taken from them and you know who it'll be given to the one that was faithful why because they were faithful <laughs> you got to be faithful church every time we go through the bulletin together it's an announcement we're announcing to you well we're announcing to you the third thing spiritual faithful thirdly if you want to be used of God you need to be available Every time you read the announcement, are you available? Because you can be spiritual and you can be trustworthy and faithful, but not available. And so, you know, life can be filled up with stuff and all kinds of things are going on and, and you're just not available and you're not making yourself available and you're not making the spiritual self-sacrificial decisions to make yourself available, to be used of God. And I am talking right now very specifically in the realm of the church because it's a great place to learn spiritual service that will enable you to be a greater spiritual witness in everything you do during the week. So we're reading through the bulletin and we're asking, are you available? Who's available? Who's available to help our junior hires? They need it. Who's available to provide scholarships? Who's available to go on a short-term mission trip? Who's available to make sure the snow is removed so that people can have unhindered access to worship center? Who's available? We can put that right over the bulletin. Who, which one of you are available? Because if you want to be used greatly of the Lord, you need to make yourself available. And fourthly, spiritual, faithful, available. And then fourthly, you need to be teachable. <laughs> because as you begin to serve and learn, you're going to learn a lot. And a lot of ways you're going to learn is through mistakes. And so you need to be teachable. If somebody come, up, come alongside and say, you know what you did? That we don't do it that way. This is the right way to do it. And you just don't cop an attitude and get all, whoa, we don't care. You know, just, no, I need to learn. I need to grow. And, and whether it's in the context of serving or it's just in the context of your relationship with God, these are all great uh, attributes to have to grow in your relationship with the Lord because God's going to teach us a lot. And one of the ways he teaches us is through tests and trials because he already knows what he's going to do. 
Not only that, look at verse 12. So when they were, what does your Bible say? Filled. They were filled. They were filled. He said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore, they gathered them up and they filled 12 baskets with the fragments of five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men who had seen the sign that Jesus did said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. (laughs) How many disciples are there again? This is participatory. How many? How many baskets were left? So that pretty much means each one got a basket. You know what I like to call those baskets? Baskets of God's faithfulness. Every one of them had to walk away with baskets of God's faithfulness. Send the people away. Oh, we don't have enough money. Oh, I don't know. We got these bread. But who, what is that in your hands, Lord? I mean, what is that? We don't, we can't. If we gave everybody a crumb, it wouldn't be enough. But at the end of God's faithfulness, Jesus, he, made, he, he, he creates so much that he said, go and gather up the fragments and put them in 12 baskets. Because we don't know how long they carried the baskets, but for the time that they did, what do, you, what do you think you'd feel? You'd just be blown away, wouldn't you? Not only you see everybody eat, but now you're walking away going, oh my, this is amazing. My God, he doesn't, doesn't meet needs. He goes over and above, exceedingly, abundantly, more than we can think or ask is what the Bible says. And it was an object lesson for them. Why? Because everything is a discipleship moment. And they walked away with these full baskets going, wow, we're all filled, they're all filled, and look at this, nothing's wasted. And that's what we also see in verse 12, don't we? So that nothing is lost. Remember, church, nothing is wasted by God, not one thing. This isn't just a statement of being frugal and wise, you know, where we just don't throw things away. Or This is, this is the reality that God does not waste anything. Which leads us to the final illustration, I think, as we wind down here. And, and to think of you and I being like the loaves and the fish in the master's hands. Where he blesses us and he breaks us and he distributes us. And then he does it again. The will of the Father for your life and mine, the heart for our ministry here at Calvary Aurora, is blessing, brokenness, and distribution. That the Lord would bless us, break us, and spread us out through our city. Now, we often pray, and I'm sure you do, and it's nothing wrong with it. Lord, bless me. Bless me, Lord. I pray for your blessings. That's great. But add to your prayer, Lord, break me. Oh, when's the last time you prayed that? Break me, Lord. Break me, Lord. Crush me. Send your test my way. I want to grow up. No, no, no. Bless me. Let me pass the test. No, it's blessing and it's breaking and then it's distribution. Replacing our will with his will. Here's the problem. The problem is, is that many of us, and perhaps it's even in our own church, never really grow up spiritually. Many never really mature in their faith. Like the author to the Hebrews said in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, so let us stop going over the basics of Christianity again and again. Let's go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start all over again with the importance of turning away from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. What the author in Hebrews is saying is to stop going over the basics. It's time to grow up. It's time to mature. It's time to be that growing man or woman of God. You see, there are some people that have and would be able to say they've known the Lord for 20 or 30 years but are still like spiritual babes in Christ. They haven't learned how to read the Bible for themselves. They haven't learned how to feed themselves. They haven't learned how to develop a deeper prayer life. They don't, they don't have a deep consistency in their involvement in a church. And it's sad, but not hopeless. It's sad, but not hopeless. Because God wants you to grow up. And I would say there are times where God wants us to grow up more than we want to grow up. And like the eagle mama, our father God will flip us out of the nest and bring us into a place of free fall so we'll learn how to trust him. We'll learn what it means to follow him. We'll learn what it is to grow up in him. He wants us to grow. He wants us to mature. Jesus is trying to teach the disciples then and us now the simple fact of trusting him to meet their needs even when they don't know where it's going to come from. You know the thing that really just blesses me here? is that Jesus takes care of this need and they still got 200 denarii in their pocket. He didn't need it. He's going to use it a different way. 
That God didn't need those resources. He chose to use the bread, but he didn't do anything with them. There's no mention of using. They didn't buy anything else. They didn't pay the kid 200 denarii for his bread. They just took it, multiply it, and even the kid that gave up what he had was blessed by being filled, overflowingly full at the buffet of Jesus Christ. And it's the same is true for me. The same is true for you. Even if you've blown it, and you're one of the ones that is just not mature, not growing up, even over years, you might even think that God is done with you. He's not done with you. He's going to continue to work in your life. You might have to suffer the consequences of a few bad decisions. You may need to face the discipline of the Lord, or what the Bible calls the chastisement, to learn to train us and grow us. But don't think that he's done with you. As long as there is breath in your lungs, God desires to use you, grow you, and mature you. And just bring what you have. Just bring who you are and let God bless you, break you, and distribute you. Amen? Amen. God, thank you again for the presence of your spirit among us, making your word come alive to us and through us. There's so much packed in these short verses, God, and we pray for deeper understanding of your grace and mercy. Lord, bless us and break us and distribute us. Let us depend upon you and not try to figure things out, but to trust you, even when we don't know how the solution is going to come to pass. I know, Lord, in my own heart, my own life, there are things that I, I don't know how it's going to work out. I, I want it to work out. It, it's, it's not from you. It's not your heart. And yet I trust you that you know what you're doing. You know what you're allowing. You know how to handle it. And I trust you all the way to eternity, Lord, all the way to your presence, all the way to being in the heavenly scene, all the way in being reunited with my son and my parents and so many that have gone before us. Looking forward to meeting Moses, looking forward to meeting David, looking forward, Lord, to meeting Mary and Deborah and Rahab. Oh, God, looking forward to the heavenly scene that I might have a heavenly mind so that I can be earthly good. And I just take great comfort today that you know what you're doing in my life. And I believe it. And I pray, God, you would help my unbelief as it rises up so often. God, bless your church. Break your church and distribute us throughout the world this week. That you would be glorified among us. That lives would be changed. And we would surrender more of ourselves to you. In Jesus' name. Amen.